There's some questions about Malone's in Hirschsprungs, and I wanted to back up on that a little bit. So most, all children with Hirschsprungs should be continent if they've had a good surgery, um, and they're not total colonic, um, and uh, what we call the dentate line has been preserved with the surgery, and also sometimes there's a stretching of the anus um, during surgery, so if they don't, um, if they have any of these things, um, then they might uh, not be continent. And so those kids may require uh, daily enemas to keep clean. Um, certainly uh, the patulous anus is a whole different topic. Um, but for those kids who maybe have not had a good surgery, um, we may offer daily enemas and that might be for a lifetime. And for those kids, um, we will certainly try laxatives over time, but if after a few trials we deem them unsuccessful, certainly a Malone procedure is an option for them. Do yeah. you want to talk a little bit about sure. that? Sure. So, uh, the, let me see. Uh, you know, as you say, if the continence mechanism is damaged at the time of the surgery, related to whatever, you know, those surgeries. Uh, I'm not there at those surgeries, right. so I don't know what happens. I just know that sometimes we meet people and the sewn connection is sewn down like below. We, the dentate line is what we use as a, it's an anatomic landmark to show where the anus begins. So that, I should be able to see that line. It's a line of little pouches all around the wall of the uh, colon, uh, the, the rectum at that point, and that's the beginning of the anus. So that should be completely normal. And then above, you can make out a faint little line where the connection was made. But if some part of that dentate line is missing, uh, that's like that means the sphincter mechanism could be damaged there. And uh, you can really have wide open anuses where the continence mechanism was really impaired. Uh, and in that situation, they may be best served either with enemas uh, or for the people that can't do enemas, maybe even an ostomy. Mm -hmm. I, I avoid the, the term for life because I just mm -hmm. don't know. That's I don't true. know that, you know, like, you know, five years from now, 10 years from now, somebody a lot smarter than me is gonna, gonna figure out a cure for that or a way to reconstruct that. Unfortunately, there is no very good artificial sphincter operation that uh, can lead to good long-term results. Artif artificial sphincters have been worked with for years, but usually when the muscle's damaged, there's a component of the sensation and the nerves, which are a critical part of continence, that are damaged as well. It's usually a complex thing. Yeah. Now, bowel management and Hirschsprungs is equally uh, a nuanced conversation because there are people that are very continent and they just don't empty. And they've had a good operation and they don't empty and they're not narrow and they don't empty and they're not too tight and they don't empty. And back, by, by the way, when you said that with the, when we try to slow them, there are some people that are really hypermodal and we try to slow them, but then we slow them too much because like you can't dial the slowness <laughs> like precisely. So yeah, great, we slowed them down. Now they're not going at all. Now we need a little enema to get it out. So you see how like the treatment can be a little contradictory to the end result that we're trying to get. Um, so that can be a challenge. But there are people who will be really incontinent or there are people who just don't empty. So we try a laxative regimen, we try everything, and if it doesn't work, we move to enemas. If you're a patient, or your child is a patient who's doing really well on enemas, great, that's great, wonderful, keep going. If you get to the point where we're doing the enemas and we've sort of come to the understanding that enemas are going to be a long-term part of our life, well then you can keep doing enemas through the bottom. Uh, I would wanna have 
really tried a few trials of laxatives uh, to see, hey, we did enemas for a year. We're great. We're clean. We're wonderful. My child's used to being in uh, big boy or big girl underwear, and they're used to the feeling of clean and dry, and they want to keep clean and dry. So they totally understand that they have to work with you on the laxative program and work with the pelvic floor physical therapist and watch their diet, and they have to sit certain times a day and really try uh, and we did that like three times and it still didn't work out. I get it. My child needs enemas. Well, if you're okay doing enemas from the bottom, then you don't ever need a Malone appendicostomy. Uh, and that's a very important point. The Malone appendicostomy is a procedure that was sort of developed by Dr. Malone, who was a urologist in the United Kingdom, who figured that this would be a great way to treat patients with spinal malformations, spina bifida, spinal dysraphism, uh, who are going to be incontinent if we don't give them a daily enema of some sort. And may maybe this makes the enema easier, you know, and maybe better. Well, in our experience, it doesn't make the enema better, but it might make it easier. So in the Malone operation, the appendix, small little piece of intestine hanging off the right side of the colon, which uh, should be present in, in Hirschsprung's patients. It should be. Years ago, uh, at the first operation for Hirschsprung's, when they would make the ostomy, they would take out the appendix and see if it had ganglion cells to make sure that the, if it had ganglion cells, then they would know that the whole colon wasn't affected. But if it didn't, they would be worried about the rest of the colon. Uh, these days, we really... Uh, don't do that anymore. There are still some people that haven't gotten that lesson, but uh, we preserve the appendix because it might be beneficial as a Malone in the future. So in a Malone, the appendix is taken and a little connection between the tip of the appendix and usually the umbilicus or the skin in the right lower part of the abdominal wall, a connection is made, a very small opening so that you can take a tube, tiny little tube and feed it in even yourself and give yourself an enema while sitting on the toilet. And in, in here at this center, when we use the Malone, we call it a flush yes. rather than an enema. Yes. And that's just a local thing. I used to just call it enema, enema. Yeah. You know, and, and Malone is often called, it's often referred to as a mace. The Malone anti-grade, which means it comes from the front rather than from the bottom, continent enema procedure. So it's uh, a, to be able to give you an enema and not leak out of the opening. Uh, is the key. Right. Okay. And usually we like to wait until the child really shows an interest in wanting to be independent and wanting to participate in their own care um, because this is a really great way to get the patient independent um, from their parents doing rectal enemas. And I, you know, you were talking about um, for life. I agree with you. You could, you never say never, you never say always. And so with a Malone, we really have not burnt any bridges. We can always try laxatives down the road and the uh, patient may succeed. And you can always stop using it. Yep. If you stop Absolutely. using a Malone, the hole will close. It will close up, it will narrow. Um, there have been situations where I've had patients that, that pass gas from their Malone and yes. it's noisy and they don't like it and they don't use it anymore and they say, do an appendectomy, yes. please take out my Malone, and yes. we, we can do that. Yes. Um, and I think once I've had a patient right. who leaked right. so poorly, and it didn't close up, and so we went in and closed it right. up surgically, right. but that rarely happens. Right. But nobody needs a Malone, and that's really important uh, to understand. It doesn't uh, make the enema better. It doesn't Sometimes make the it's better. a little more problematic. It takes a little time to adjust to it. Right. And sometimes we have issues with a Malone flush that you might not have had with the rectal enema. With the rectal enema, we're using a catheter with a balloon up the bottom. So we're giving the colon hold time with the irritants, and that's really what makes the colon contract. With the Malone, we're giving it from the top and we're just letting it drip in. We don't have that same hold time we had um, with the rectal enema, and so sometimes um, we have to make adjustments for that. Right, the thing about the Malone is that, you know, somebody really should want the Malone. You know, I've had patients, you know, we're, this is a surgical center, and I'm a surgeon, and it should be no surprise to anybody that I want to do surgery, okay? We like to do surgery. I love doing Malones. Uh, for people that 
really would benefit from Malone's. Like if you wouldn't benefit from the Malone, I don't want to do a Malone for you. It's not right. So I've had patients where, like I check, a uh, teenage patient, like, hey, uh, you know, are you doing the anima? Yeah, I'm doing the anima. It's, go, it's going fine. Well, uh, how do you, uh, you know, like, do you do it like yourself or like, you know, yeah, yeah, do it myself. And they do it themselves uh, with no help. Uh, they, they're old enough to have thrown the parent out of the bathroom and they do it through their bottom themselves. I, I, I'm amazed by it. You know, I struggle to tie my shoes. I, I don't know how people are able to do that, but they do. And those patients, they don't need Malone's. But that said, I have had patients come to me in their sixth and seventh decades of life. I haven't operated on anybody uh, over 80 yet for this, but I have made Malone's on in people in their 60s and 70s because they know they need the enemas, they just can't bend, and they struggle to do it themselves at that point. And by doing them alone, it changes it, they can do it themselves, and it's dramatically easy, uh, dramatically easier. Sometimes we do a straight Malone in the traditional way where uh, you feed the tube in yourself. Mm -hmm. Some patients benefit from actually having a Malone, but having a chait button through the Malone. A chait button is a button uh, designed by Peter Chait, who was, a, was an interventional radiologist at the Hospital for Sick Children in Toronto, where uh, they placed it directly into the colon and a little pigtail part of it kept it from falling out. And uh, it has a little trap door uh, cap and you open the cap plug into it, and then you can give yourself the anima or the flush directly into the right colon. A chait classically done is done by an interventional radiologist, not a surgeon, uh, but surgeons uh, can do them, and I know surgeons that do place them. I will use that chait device, but not right into the colon. I won't do that. I don't believe in it. I think it's got too many complications for me, and I'm a surgeon. I make Malone's because I believe in my heart of hearts that it's a better procedure. Uh, but some people struggle to pass the catheter, and in that situation, putting a chait button through the Malone is, I think, the best of both worlds. Yes. And now we have a new product um, by AMT. Um, they have a new um, mini ACE. It's just like a G-tube. It's made specifically for a Malone and um, it's blown up with a little balloon. So instead of that curly cue in the track, you now just have a balloon.